I'm not new here, but no, not at all. this is a new and original lecture. So it's still in um, uh, in kind of work uh, working um, paper. Um, and actually, I put some of this stuff together. Yeah, you know, people were saying I'd better name drop because um, people may have heard of Akram Khan, famous dancer. Oh, am I all right? Sorry, you just put that. Oh, what have I done? In your jump. Uh, is that good? Yeah. Akram Khan. Um, he. I, some of you might have seen the work he did last year called Xenos, which is the Greek uh, guest or stranger which was themed on the First World War, but he tried to use the Prometheus story in, in that. And um, he invited some people to come and talk in a workshop to uh, discuss this story. Um, and I was, uh, I was involved with that, so I was putting this stuff together for that. But this is a bit developed. Um, and what I'm going to do is look at, start with hunter-gatherers. I always start with hunter-gatherers. I'm an anthropologist of hunter-gatherers. Um, because, well, they're most representative of our evolution, I'm going to look at stories amongst egalitarian African hunter-gatherers. Um, I mean gender egalitarian, really. Uh, move into some Australian Aboriginal material, and then I'm going to see if that gives us a handle to, with which to investigate Prometheus's story. Um, uh, so that is then a source of Indo-European indubitably highly patriarchal agricultural um, uh, society producing that story, of course. Um, so yeah, let's just um, begin with the hunter-gatherers, why hunter-gatherers matter. Um, we have been hunter-gatherers for so large a part of our existence, so many generations that our hearts and souls, our bodies, our brains are hunter-gatherer formed in the phase of hunter-gatherer evolution and most especially we evolved in, in egalitarian political circumstances. That is what hunter-gatherers really teach us and I'm going to speak about so, um, a little bit about the Bayaka, so some of the western pygmies but mainly um, Mbuti and Ife uh, stories, the Hadza who were over here in Tanzania um, for uh, African hunter-gatherers. I will only have a picture of some uh, Khoisan material. Um, so uh, just to say about our biology, particularly for those of you who are new here, um, our bodies really are the evidence that we evolved as egalitarian hunter-gatherers. Um, and the best evidence of this comes from our eyes. Our eyes are known as cooperative eyes. Um, we have evolved all humans on the planet have this long almond shape with the white sclera background, and the dark iris, which means that we are showing each other what we're looking at, what we're interested in. We're looking into each other's eyes. We're finding out from each other what our own thoughts. This is known as intersubjectivity. By contrast, all these great apes have round and dark eyes. They are not showing each other what they're thinking. They are deliberately not showing each other what they're thinking. They have not been selected in evolution to do that, um, simply because their societies are really too competitive. Um, Sarah Hurdy is a great evolutionary anthropologist who's made the argument that the matrix, the, the origins, the, the situation which would have given rise to selection pressure for our ability to read each other's minds, to me mesh our, our mental states. Sarah Hurdy argues that um, this was, uh, came about through cooperative childcare, cooperative, so others than mothers and others, others than the mothers taking care of children. Um, and this gives rise to very special human types of life history. Um, that may go back over more than a million and a half years. Childhood is something that no other great ape has. Uh, when a child has been weaned from the mother but is still not able to look after itself and needs help with getting food. Um, and we're going along with that, the grandmothering f um, stage of life history, um, post-menopause, uh, post-reproductive lifespan. These two aspects of human evolution are really only going to develop 
in a situation of relative egalitarianism, of, uh, of uh, ability to create these cooperative breeding networks with female relatives, female kin coalitions fundamentally. Um, and our, the major piece of evidence for our egalitarian former uh, evolutionary um, origins as egalitarian hunter-gatherers is this extraordinary increase of brain size from three million years ago with just chimp brain sizes of Australopithecines. Two million years ago, that had doubled. So this is really where cooperative breeding, grandmothers, children, um, the beginnings of cooperative eyes really start there. But it's here that the egalitarianism would be the, at its strongest. In the last half million years, um, with this three times, the reason why brains are so indicative of the fact that we, we must have had relatively very egalitarianism, I mean gender egalitarianism relations, is that um, this is so the, the energy needed by mothers to raise offspring with these huge increases of brain size, that selection pressure for such large brain size. This is a huge energy drain. Mothers were getting enormous amounts of support, help, food, um, ultimately from males who down here and with great apes backwards in hominin evolution, males would have been doing hardly anything, hardly anything to help at all. So that is a, a revolution, a revolution that women won, children won, and men won. We all won. Um, in terms of fire, I haven't marked it in here, but the real record of the archaeological record of fire comes as a regularity, well, within a million years, but as a regularity in the half million years. It is part of this story in the reality of the archaeology of, of, of fire um, in, in our archaeological record. But if, if this was a, some kind of revolution that, that occurred, um, let me just run through what Rag argues actually occurred. Um, and the fundamental block for women in being able to gain enough energy to produce offspring with such large brain sizes would be the behavior of, of dominant males, like doing great ape type strategies where dominant males were trying to access and monopolize more than one female, not producing investment for females. So females did something about that. And the other aspect of our biology, which is showing our egalitarian heritage, is quite simply um, women's reproductive signals. Um, the, what do we show in terms of reproduction? Um, and I'm now going to move to why menstruation matters so much, just very briefly. Um, what do we show in terms of fertility signals is actually nothing at all in terms of ovulation signals, we, we have confused the issue very much to males, women have to, to men, um, and we have this very long period of sexual receptivity, longer than any other ape. Um, and so what that does, what that means, is that a male who's trying to pursue, trying to find females, fertile females, move on to the next one, move on to the next one, which is a typical great ape strategy, actually doesn't have information. The, the female is not helping him. Instead, the female is, is confusing the matter and making a male who wants to mate her and, and um, be fertile and, and get her pregnant have to stay with her for long periods. Um, so we've evolved that strategy. But menstruation gives, gives the game away. Menstruation actually does uh, show where, who amongst, if we take, if we have schematically a group of females who are um, pregnant, lactating, bre breastfeeding, some menopausal, any female who's menstruating is a very good candidate for a, a male who wants to try and muscle in and get hold of that female. That, that's his obvious target. Um, and this is quite clearly, menstruation would have become a very important, it, it didn't evolve as a signal, but quite clearly it became a very important signal. And this is the reason why 
menstruation as biological uh, phenomenon became so hedged around in terms of culture with taboos and all kinds of observances. Um, so this is a female problem that this is probably their relative. They don't want to let that girl or woman um, be you know, grabbed hold of by any of those males, particularly any alpha male. Um, so they've got to do something about it. It's a female problem. The females have got to solve that problem. So get hold of your girl. You want to keep hold of her. She's a very precious resource with her signal. And then you confuse the males again. This is what's known as female cosmetic coalitions. It's, it's become quite a well-known theory of the emergence of ritual and symbolic culture in, um, in human evolution. Um, so at that point, when, when females are creating that kind of picket line of, of all of them, they're sharing blood or they're sharing, they're using uh, pigments. Um, so this theory um, tells us why the human archaeological record is full of red ochre. Um, everywhere that Homo sapiens goes, as Homo sapiens leaves Africa, w we carry this red ochre with us. And this seems to be the, the um, marker, the indicator. It's like a cultural indicator of our species and the marker of a ritual tradition. Um, so the, the females there are signaling no to any a male who is a philanderer, a dominant male who just wants to grab the menstrual female and then leave her when he's done the, his worst. By contrast, these males, the males who cooperate and become investors are the ones who are fueling that extraordinary rise in brain size. Um, and so it may have, the outcomes may have been different in different human populations, but in our ancestors, something like this happened. So when we come to present day hunter gatherers or very recent historic hunter gatherers this is what that ritual start actually looks like so that was just a hypothesis but this is actually what it looks like um, and what it is this is a picture from it's actually from about the, the 90s or late 80s in the central kalahari of one of the rituals that's maybe the oldest in the world the elan bull dance which is a girl's first menstruation the girl is inside this, this hut um, as um, this precious and powerful entity who's menstruating. And around her are all these, these uh, ladies dancing with fantastic um, ancient music with the Elan scales. And they're using these, they're dancing as if they were Elans, doing mating postures as if they were Elans. And sh they are mating with her, the girl, as if she's the Elan bull. Um, they're using these horns to prick and chase away any young hunter who comes too close. So they're creating a kind of picket line, a wall around that girl as she's menstruating. Why are they turning into Elans? They are saying no to the men. They are placing taboos on themselves and the, the young women we aren't the right species, we're the wrong species, we're not even humans, we're the wrong sex, we're males. The girl is the Elan bull. Um, this is the construction of a, of a symbolic taboo on the menstrual um, si signal there. And uh, so this is the basis of a, a gender egalitarianism that's very characteristic. Um, by making the girl's blood the Elan's blood, Elan is a very um, desired, fat, huge, large antelope in, in the African ecology. Um, they are sending away the hunters to hunt the Elan. And then when the hunters have, have, have um, shot and tracked the Elan and caught it and are bringing it back, because the Elan is bleeding, it's like the girl who is bleeding there is taboo on the blood of the girl and the animal. Therefore, the hunters must bring it right back to the camp. This is the idea. Um, OK, so now, having just kind of illustrated the basic idea in, of, of Rag's sex strike idea, um, the, the ability of women to say no to sex and therefore to control and command men to bring meat back to camp where the meat will be um, cooked 
and, and fire will be used. Okay, that, that's the basic model. Let's now start to turn to the myths. <coughs> and the first person who uh, was talking about the structures, particularly of blood and fire in mythology, is Levi Strauss, who we've had two weeks, the last two weeks, some of you were here, looking at um, myths actually from volume three from Mythologique. But of course, mo volume one of his great um, four volume uh, investigation of American Indian stories um, is the raw and the cooked. So he has this fundamental structure of raw blood on this side and fire on this side. Fire actually turns out to involve a certain special kind of celestial or medicine fire. This is kind of a sacred fire that goes on the side of blood. Cooking fire is always here associated to cooking. Celestial fire, blood, noise, which would go with the noise of the ritual, like the Elam bull dance that we just showed, associates with kinship, not with marriage. So raw blood and kinship versus fire, cooking, marriage, honeymoon, that is bitter moon. It's the opposite of honeymoon, lune de miel, lune de fiel, the bitter moon. So this is sort of the very basic opposition um, that Levi-Strauss drew out of, of his thousand myth investigation in mythology. When we did the Wives of Sun and Moon, which has the noise myth, the tripe, chewing contest. This was the investigation as to whether noise could be made by the all-purpose wife, um, for those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this opposition between noise and cooking is something that's kind of, wh why should that be? Well, the best, the person who really explained it is Chris Knight um, with his famous sex strike model. Um, and Knight was, Chris, was was explaining all uh, Levi-Strauss's structures, he could, um, if you want to find out about this, I would recommend going to look at Chris's PhD on Levi-Strauss's structures of myth. Um, he could explain, he could give a material explanation for Levi-Strauss's structures, whereas Levi-Strauss thought they came from the structures of the mind, that somehow our brains were just wired like that. Chris had a story, the story that I've just been telling you, that at the dark of the moon, women went on strike. Women said no. They used the signals of wrong sex, wrong species. We're not, this isn't the right time. We're all menstruating. Just that so I've been showing with the Elan bull dance. And this is the phase, this waxing phase is the phase of blood with menstruation, ritual, noise, no cooking, we're not cooking because there's no meat. The men are hunting. The moonlight, the moonlight at night starts to become very useful for hunters because if they're out in the bush in the dark, and we're gonna hear some stories about that, if they're out in the bush in the dark, moonlight will help them get home. Um, and they need to get home by full moon because the nights after full moon, you get darkness after sunset. So at full moon, they should bring the kill the Eland, whatever kill it is, back to the camp, and then all the taboos, all the blood taboos, can get lifted. And we have um, feasting, sex, flesh can be consumed by everybody. So this is the phase of marriage without taboo. Cooking, feasting, marital sex. Um, so waxing, taboo, blood, waning moon, feasting, relaxation, everybody relaxes until the dark moon again and sex strike. Okay, so um, and Chris showed us this last week in respect of Momoneki, um, the story we had last week, um, that that will lead to a periodic, a periodicity, an oscillation of um, conjoining of marital couples at full moon, but they're separated because they join their kin at dark moon. And so kinship, human kinship in its earliest origins would have had this periodic characteristic. Instead of people being stuck permanently with a marital partner, they would be moving between their husbands and brothers, or if they're men, wives and sisters. Um, 
An important aspect of the miss that we looked at um, the last two weeks was that they were searching for this periodicity. They were afraid, those myths were worried that the aspect of periodicity had been lost because instead of people being able to move freely from marital partner to kin, kin's person, marital partner, they were like stuck in one place, especially in patrilocal marriage. Women were no longer able to go back to their kin is what those myths were talking about. Um, and therefore the myths were were probing, well, what is ha going to happen to our cosmos? What is going to happen to our universe? Because if we lose this periodicity, what then? How are we going to solve that problem? Now, I'm saying this clearly because in the stories I'm, I'm going to look at, this aspect of periodicity is, is very important, and it is in Prometheus as well. Um, so that's the overview. Um, this is probably a little bit small for you, but uh, this is the syntax overview of what goes. If we look at any magical myth, we should be finding permutations and combinations of these terms in the waxing moon, seclusion, eclipse, thunder, noise, night, death, incest in terms of kinship, wetness, bleeding, associated to menstruation, ritual, hunger, you don't, you become, you are eaten, you don't eat. On this side, um, you become animal, you become the opposite gender in that. But on the waning moon, that is when you're feasting, um, it's bright as day, um, boys and girls come out to play, the moon does shine as bright as day, Day, life, this world, marital sex, dry and cooked, cooked against the raw, as we said. So this structure actually looks a lot like Levi-Strauss's structure. Um, but this time, now we have some explanation, some motivation for it. So this structure applies for our earliest origins as a kind of big bang of the symbolic structure of mythology, mythology um, myths and rituals. Um, and I'm going to look at uh, some of the um, actual stories and ritual in a couple of hunter-gatherer of African groups to start off with. Okay, so let's have a go at that. Okay, so this is an amazing photo um, taken by Jerome Lewis, who works here. And you can't see very much, or you could try switching the lights off, but you still can't see very much because this ritual, which is known as Malobe, happens in the darkness of the moon. Now that is what we would predict from the model that I've been showing you. The time that is the time of maximum ritual power is dark moon. Um, in the dark of the moon, Malobe, the Bayaka people, um, the Benjele also known as, um, women are singing to the moon who is like their husband. They are singing mystically in conversation um, yeah, you can't get it much, much brighter. It's just a dark photograph because it's taken in the darkness. <laughs> you, at this time, uh, women are addressing the moon, their biggest husband, um, and they're singing um, in a kind of entranced state. And everything is dark. All the fires are put out. So we have anti-fire. These rituals are just anti-fire. Um, and by their singing, they lure from the forest, so these are p the pygmy groups of the Western um, Congo forest, they lure from the forest these spirits that glimmer because they have a bioluminescence that can just, just faintly be seen in, and they sort of rustle and glimmer um, as they're lured from the forest in, the, in this ceremony of Malobe. Okay, now the first story I'm gonna start with rather than with the Ebengele is with the Eastern pygmies, the Mbuti, and the Efe over in the Turi forest. Um, and what I'm going to highlight is this periodicity here. So this is a really simple story giving us the, the periodicity um, in, the, in this account of origins of, of fire. Um, so it's the tale of um, Matu, who's the old mother of uh, a deity, a, a spirit known as Tore. And Tore is a well, he's a lord of the dead and a master of the game animals. So he governs the success in hunting. 
and he's also called the one who swings across the abyss. Matu's old mother is sleeping by his fire. But one day an ancestor of the Efe people comes and steals the fire and flies, flees away. She wakes up cold, does Matu, and he, she calls out to Tora to swing out after the, the thief. And Tora can do that and catches him and the fire is brought back. A second Efe ancestor, a brother, comes and tries to get the fire. But again, Torres alerted, he goes, he swings out and catches the thief and the fire comes back. Then a third one is disguised as a magical bird, flies down on the fire which isn't guarded. A Matu wakes up with a startled scream, but this time Torre is not able because the bird flies so fast he cannot swing far enough to catch and the ancestor escapes with the fire. So he calls the man, he says, you're my brother from the same mother. Why didn't you ask me for the fire? I could have given it to you. But when he comes back to his camp, um, empty handed, his old mother is dead and cold and the fire's gone out. And then Tora curses the people with a punishment of death. And so this tale is giving us both the origins of fire and the origins of death. Now, Tore is actually the name in the Efe um, group of the Men's Secret Society. So it's a kind of hunting, hunter's society. Um, while Matu, his mother's name, has a connotation of menstrual blood. And is, so she is kind of the, the dying moon, the dark moon, uh, as the moon dies away. And she also governs um, the game animals. Now, what's quite remarkable is that that story from the Efe and the, the Mbuti is that uh, Colin Turnbull, uh, anthropologist who wrote a lovely book called The Forest People, amongst many others, um, he gave us an account of a ritual drama um, which seems to enact this story of Matu and in particular enact this periodicity of, of the fire, the fire being taken away, the fire, the fire being taken away. This movement between sort of fire and blood, because after all, the old woman's name is, is menstrual blood. And, and in this account, um, uh, have I got, um, yeah, we, the, uh, Turnbull is talking about the Molimo, which is the secret society of, it's like the Torre for the Efe, the Molimo for the Mbuti. Molimo has um, an instrument which makes extraordinary noises. Now, actually, the thing is like a drain pipe. It's like a plastic drain pipe. It doesn't look like anything. But the issue is not what it looks like, but the sounds it makes. It makes these sounds of the animals of the forest. And when men bring, men bring this as a secret power into the camps, um, it's always in the darkness. In, uh, again, it's, it's got to be darkness. Women are supposed to move right away. They shouldn't see this instrument of darkness, the molimo. And men are kind of govern a, a fire, a sacred fire called the Molimo fire during these, this period of the Molimo ritual. But in Turnbull's account, he, he tells of this, um, the arrival in the camp of this very old crone, very old woman with um, a, a, young, a slightly younger barren woman uh, called Kondabati who becomes her apprentice as a ritual leader. And they've arrived to teach the girls of Elima. Now, Elima is the girls' first menstruation <coughs> ceremony. It's the initiation camp for the girls. And Colin Turnbull realizes that as these two women are working with the girls, the girls are starting to sing Molimo songs. They're ta taking over the songs of the men. Um, and they have literally, on one night, very in the darkness, the girls are starting to take over the space of the men and the fire and come with their songs. Um, and in particular, it is this old woman who enacts something like the role of Matu in, in doing so. Um, and I'll just read a few passage, a little passage of, of the description of, how, of what is the drama that ensues as these girls come to take over the space from the men. So this old lady, she's in trance, she's got stare, she's bird-boned little um, person with, with piercing eyes. 
She seems to hover an instance, that skinny old crone who should have been burned to a cinder in a flash. But she whirled around and kicked out with her feet, scattering the sacred Molimo fire in all directions. Blazing logs and glowing embers alike, she scattered right amongst the circle of men surrounding her. And then she danced away, erect and proud. The men, without even faltering in their song, quickly gathered all the scattered embers and threw them back onto the remaining coals. And then for the first time, moved in a dance of their own. They danced in a wild circle. And as they danced, their bodies swayed backwards and forwards, facing the fire as though by imitation of the act of sex, they were giving the fire new life. And as they danced, the flames slowly began to rise. And as they rose, the men danced all the more violently until they brought the fire of the Malima back to life. Twice more this happened. Each time the old woman made a, a more determined effort than ever to stamp the fire out of existence. And each time the strangely beautiful, exciting, erotic dance of the men gave it new life. Finally, the old woman conceded defeat and retreated amongst the others. Shortly afterwards, all the women disappeared and the men rearranged themselves at Kuma Molima, the sacred fire of Molima. Um, so Turnbull checks in with his, inf his key informant amongst the, the, the pygmies and, and he realises that this is referring to these old stories, like the story of Matu that we just heard, that once women were the ones who owned, well, they owned the Molimo, the, the noise-making instruments, the animals of the forest, but they owned the fire as well, or they originally gained the fire from the, the forest, the chimpanzees, or so forth. Um, so this enactment of stamp out the fire, the men raising the fire again, stamping it out, raising it again, um, is echoing that story of, of the myth. So we have fire, origins of fire, associating to origins of death, and I'm now going to tell another story from African hunter-gatherers where association to the origins of sex as well is, is very strong. Um, and this comes with the Hadza from Tanzania, where I've done some work. And we again have a key ritual. So just as Malobe and Molimo, the, the darkness the, was the essential characteristic for the ritual, for Epime, again, this ritual is phased by the darkness of the moon. Um, and it really is a ritual of noise and singing with the, men, uh, the men's use of um, these, these uh, bells on their ankles as they perform a stamping dance and the, the singeno rattle um, being used with this, this headdress. They, they're all in darkness. The men and the women are sitting quite separately and they can't even see, they can hardly see each other. It's, just the, like the Malobe, the spirits glimmering in the deep dark with only the light of the Milky Way that can give light. Um, the, this epime is founded on the women singing, as is Malobe. It is always the women singing that makes it happen. It's, it, that, that is the real energy. Um, but let's just hear a, um, the, well, I'll, t I'll tell the story. I'll be able to tell it um, myself, this story. Um, what, ha, what is the origins of fire, according to the uh, Hadza? Um, the first people, this is their creation story. The first people of the Hadza were called Ikanawangube Kenebe. And they were stick people. They were just tall, thin, um, very, they didn't, they couldn't bend. They had no joints or articulation. And because they couldn't bend down, um, they therefore couldn't make fire. Um, and the spirit Heine comes walking, he's walking on the earth um, and he asks a woman please to make some fire because he wants to cook some an eland. But she can't, the, uh, not only can she not bend, but the earth is so wet, it's sodden. So what Heine does is he takes the wet earth and the, the sky above and he just turns them right round. He just goes like that. And therefore, the earth can dry because it can rain, and the sky now becomes the dry earth. And now Heine makes a fire, and he says to the woman, this is, I've brought you this eland, and now you can cook the eland, shows, shows her the fire in the eland, and now you can give to all the people. So he's given the meat and the fire to the woman to, to give to all the people. And now the people are 
the Gilana Bay. The, they've reached a new stage. And how Heine makes them the Gilana Bay is he, he knocks their knees, gives them so that they can sit down. They can sit down by the fire and they can get warm um, and eat roast meat for the first time. But the Gelenar Bay people, they still don't have children because, yeah, they're not quite getting, they're not doing the sex right. The men keep trying to have sex between women's toes. So there are no children as a result. So Heiner thinks he's got to sort this out. So he goes up to a hunter one day, he walks up to a hunter one day in the bush and taps him on the shoulder and says, um, you know that between the toes, stop, stop the between the toes, try it between the thighs and see how that works. And so he looked. The next day or two, he finds the hunter again. He says, well, how did that go? And the hunter said, oh, yes, very nice. <laughs> and he said, well, keep going, keep going, because then, and he does. The hunter has sex between the thighs with his wife, and she gets pregnant. And this is the first time there'd been a pregnancy. So Hannah says, well, keep her inside the hut to start off, just keep her inside the hut. And then when the baby's born, they bring the baby outside and everyone's looking. Oh, my God, this child, this, where did that come from? Um, and Heiner realizes he's got to get the hunter to tell all the other men. So this is his great secret of sex. So Heiner gives another Eland. The Eland is always involved with this, this story. Another Eland to the hunter who knows the secret of sex. And that hunter calls and he says to him, you've got to tell the other guys. That, so it's like you've got to spread the knowledge of sex to all the guys, all the hunters. You can't keep it just one like alpha male. So you, he gives the Elan, the, the men have the Elan, they're gathering it and they're going to bring that Elan back to the camp where the fire is. But there is a, a monster, an entity who does not want the men to know the secret of sex. And this is expressed as the destruction of fire. Um, I've written the name up on the board, so this is the magic word for today. Um, the entity is which is, you can all say that, um, which is sometimes called a male monster, but actually the ko is a female ending. So this is like a she, he, they, gender ambiguous entity. It's like a mantis. And in an, a mantis in Hadza country is like that size. Um, and if you see one, it is um, a good luck. You must not harm it because it will destroy your hunting. And this ko has to do with the luck um, it can uh, influence the, the luck of the hunt, the arrows as it flies. But in this story, Kokoko is wanting to stop the men knowing about sex. So Kokoko bars their way as they're trying to carry the Elam back to camp. But the men have their fire, so they burn the top of Kokoko's head and it runs off screaming. Now, this is quite interesting because the word also refers to kind of the top of the a, a part of the top of the head which seems to have an importance in in um, in trance we heard from Chris Lowe a couple of weeks ago um, on the trance healing dance with the Bushman and this idea of may be referring to that too so the men have scared off but but the entity comes back to try again to stop them from getting home. And the trick that Kotoko has is to make the sun set more quickly. Kotoko has power over fire, power over dark, of darkness. And set the sun sets, the men are caught in, trapped in the bush, out in the bush before they can get home. Um, and they, uh, they, they have to sit down they create a thorn bush circle, but because they have their fire, they have the eland, they survive through the long dark night. And uh, the powers of are, are, are dissipated. Um, so they get home, bring home the eland, and for the and in that in that night, 
the hunter, the hunter who has the secret is able to tell all the other men the secret of sex. So now the Gelenabe people can start to have sex the right way, all of them between women's thighs and have babies. So here we have origins of fire going with origins of sex very strongly. And again, this periodicity of a sort of female monster, uh, the ending makes it a female monster, trying to prevent men having sex or having fire. Okay, right. So those two are um, both, those stories are both coming from gender egalitarian hunter-gatherers um, concerning origins of fire with control over meat, um, control over fire, and either the emergence of death, the beginnings of death, or the beginnings of sex, uh, actually. Um, the, where I want to go to next is to Australia. And the reason for drawing on Australian traditions is that whereas the African groups are very gender egalitarian, that is not true in Australia. Um, and particularly in Northeast Arnhem Land. This is drawing on Chris Knight's work on um, mythology of Northeast Arnhem Land um, and the ritual where men monopolize ritual power in, in a series of initiations from which women are at pain of, of death excluded from secrets, secrets of initiation. Um, um, but the way that men gain ritual power is by menstruating, by menstruating collectively and performing their rituals with a mythology which concerns the origins of culture and, and the origins of everything, the creation, by two menstruating sisters. Um, in one set of stories, the Wawalak sisters, um, which Chris has lectured on a number of times before, and in this particular, in the origin of fire stories, the Jungle Wall Sisters. Um, this is from the Yongu uh, culture of the Northeast Arnhem Land. And it's just a nice image of the Jungle Wall. And I'm going to read a certain amount from um, Chris's discussion of the uh, Jungle Wall. So the Jungle Wall Sisters um, have created the world. They are the creators. They have a supreme possession, which is their wombs the uterus. Every effort in, in the description of the jungle wall emphasizes how po powerful their reproductive organs are. And you can just see the images because these women, these, these sisters are giving birth to batch after batch of being, of peoples, of animals, of things, sort of flowing out of their wombs. Um, and they are construed as being pouring rivers of blood, of afterbirth blood, with these births, these creative births. Okay. Um, so, but in addition to their wombs, they also are depicted as dragging along the ground immense clitorises, which are so huge, they're like great snakes, like these, these like, like kind of penises. So, so this means that they not only have these super powerful generative wombs, but they also can use their long, long clitorises to actually impregnate themselves. So they're completely autonomous of, uh, 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 you know, need a, need a man? Well, I don't think so. Um, so they insert into their own cunts these clitorises, these clitorises as penises um, and can create endless uh, amounts of beings. Now, if there is a male in these myths, it is their younger brother. And the younger brother is, acknowledges the ritual authority of his older sisters. He's also incestuous. So remember our syntax in the mythology that the phase of blood will entail incestuous kinship relations, um, that, or it's coded in that way. So these, this brother will have sex with these sisters, but it, 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 he's completely acknowledging that they are his great leaders. And I always follow you, he says. The two sisters wander across the landscape and they give things the names that they have in the present day. So uh, one of the um, informants for Warner, who did his work with the, well, they, he called them the Moongin, but the same people, the um, Yongu. 
They gave all the trees, stones, birds, animals, everything names. They named the mud and everything. That's why we have names for these things today. We didn't name them ourselves. Sacred objects known as rangas fell from their wombs at various places as the women wander on their journey. For example, a very large ranga fell from the younger sister's womb at the Yawa Yawa well of the Naladia people on Napier's Peninsula. Those two women squatted down there and a stone ranga fell out of the womb of the young one. This stone can be seen a short distance from the well. Anyone can go touch it. That stone is bigger than a house. Women do not know it is a ranga. That means women in the present day, because now they are excluded from ritual secrets, uh, but originally women created it. At Nguru Ninana on Elko Island, the sisters left magic dreamings, the most important of which was the red ochre dreaming. The sisters are said to have spoken here. We leave this red ochre so that all the people may get it from us. Red ochre, says Ronald Burnt, is symbolic of afterbirth blood being shed by the two sisters. It's also associated with the redness of the sun. Today, red ochre of Elko Island is traded all the way along the coasts, up and down and far inland. The myth explains when the sisters possess the rangas, that is the ritual power which comes from their own sexual organs, they could therefore compel men to hunt for them. In the old times, says the informant from uh, Warner, in the old times, men used to get food for women and the women sat down on the inside and looked after the rangas. But then something terrible happened. One day, the sisters camped as usual in their sacred shade, a place of seclusion and intimacy, which was forbidden to men. Unknown to them, a group of sons and brothers who had recently emerged, so there's some of the last ones who've just emerged from the sisters' wombs, were hiding nearby. They enviously watched from afar as the all-powerful sisters held a sacred Nara ceremony, which was their own business, to which men could not come. It was during this ceremony the women made fire, Rinjare, the sacred fire dreaming, for fire comes from the redness of women's cunts, according to Ronald Burnt. The sun's full disc at midday is termed dagu, gambai, or dala, which refers to cunt, vagina, if you have to say that. And it's from the valvi of the sisters that the sun's rays come. So we've got the logic here. Women have control of this fire, and if they want to obliterate the fire, they just put it up their cunts, and then it's not there. If they want the fire to come out and be used, they, it comes from the heat of their generative organs, but they can hide it. They can withdraw it. They can withdraw it because they have control over their sexual organs. They have control over their sexual accessibility, uh, their sexual availability. Think in terms of the sex strike. Um, if women are saying no at Dark Moon, obliterating the fire because there's no cooking fire, they withdraw it. It's as if they withdraw it up their cunts. Okay. There's the logic there. So the story is giving us that logic. So after the ceremony, this is when the disaster comes, the women hung their fighting dilly bags with tassels of red parakeet feathers on a tree and they went to collect shellfish. So the older sister says to the young, we better put our dilly bags in this shade and leave them here a while. What are we going to do, asked the younger. If we put them here, what are we going to do? Well, we can look for shells around the mangrove. So they abandon their dilly bags in the sacred shade and the sacred fire is still burning there. Then they go to collect their shells. But as soon as the women had gone, the men crept up. The men sat listening in their shade, and when they heard no noise, no singing or dancing, they said to one another, all right, it's no good. We're men, it's no good. Women should have that sacred bag and all the dressings, and we have nothing. We'll take over from those women. Yes, they all agreed, yes. So they came up to the women's sacred shade and went inside. And there they found all the dreamings, all the ranga and clan patterns. They began to dance and sing the sacred songs which they'd learned by listening to the women. 
and which are still sung today in the Dua Nara. As they sang, they looked in the direction the women had taken but saw no sign of them. Then they took down the sacred dilly bag of the women and danced with it. The sisters were still out collecting shellfish and suddenly they heard a Junman bird crying aloud. What's it crying for? asked the younger sister. That bird cries to let us know, answered the other. Perhaps something's happened to our sacred dilly bags. Maybe fire has burnt them. We'd better go back and look. They left what they were doing and ran back towards their shade. The dilly bags were gone and on the ground about the shade were the tracks of the men who'd stolen them. Sister, look, cried the younger sister. What are we going to do? Where are our dilly bags? We'd better go down and ask the men, said the other. It's nothing to do with them. They hurried off down towards the men. As they came running, the jungle brother and his companions looked up from the shade and saw them. What shall we do, thought the brother. He picked up his Jungalung singing sticks, which he'd stolen from the sisters, and began to beat rhythmically upon them, and, and they all began to sing. As soon as the sisters heard the beat of the singing sticks and the sound of the men singing, they fell down and began to crawl on the ground. So the story concludes by confirming what, that what's really been stolen from women um, are kind of symbolic vaginas or cunts. And to use the terms of, of the sex strike template, this is their rights of control over their sexual availability. The sisters are forced to the ground into a sort of subordination, overthrown from their position of dominance by the power of the men's songs. But they console themselves with the thought, at least they still have their mighty reproductive organs. They still have this generative power. The men had taken from them not only these songs and the emblems, but also the power to perform sacred ritual, a power which formerly belonged only to the sisters. They had carried the emblems and dreamings in their ngenmara, which are conical mats, which symbolized wombs. And the men had had nothing. The two sisters got up from the ground and the younger one said to the elder, what are we going to do? All our dilly bags are gone. All the emblems, all our power, our sacred ritual. The other replied, I think we can leave that. Men can do it now. They can look after it. We can spend our time collecting bush foods for them. For it's not right they should get the food as they have been doing. We know everything. We've really lost nothing, for we remember it all. We can let them have that small part. Aren't we still sacred, even if we have lost the bags? Haven't we still got our wombs? And the younger sister agreed with her. So in that way, the two sisters left all their dreamings at the place. Uh, so among the dreamings left behind with the sacred fire dreamings, the Nara ritual of fire whose source comes from the redness of women's cunts. But the, this final detail I just want to emphasize so that the menstrual sex strike theory is saying in the origins, women use their solidarity to pursue strategic female interest for getting men to provide food for their children, the women and children. This menstrual prohibition on raw meat meant that men had to bring the meat back to the camp, to the fire, to lift the taboo of blood. Um, but now, in this situation of the female overthrow, a kind of a depiction of a world historic defeat of the female sex here um, amongst this Aboriginal people, um, women can no longer use their ritual power. They are ceding that ritual power to men and the logic then economically is that they become the ones who economically service the men's rituals by producing food for men. And that is indeed what does happen amongst the Mungin and Yongu, um, that the men's initiation, the secret initiation of boys, when men are menstruating by cutting open their genitals or cutting open different parts of themselves, and the boys have to be cut in ways that make them menstruate, like the ancestral sisters. And the men give birth to the boys because women giving birth is now uh, no longer sacred uh, uh, in the, the um, cosmos of the Yongu. Um, so we're there getting a picture for 
uh, this overthrow, this overthrow of ritual power from women to men by by this highly non-egalitarian hunter-gatherer um, uh, culture. So we've had um, the origins of fire in connection with with death, the origins of fire in connection with the first sex. And here again in, in the Aboriginal story, the origins of fire in connection with sex, women's control of sex. So there's it's a kind of there are three things that are going together, really. Um, control over meat, who has control over meat? The those who have control of fire should have control of meat. And if if they have control of fire and uh, meat, they should have control over sexual availability. But if women lose that control of fire and meat, they may lose their ability to say no, their ability to go on sex strike, their ability to mount ritual resistance. Okay? So these things are going together. Um, and they're expressed in these myths with a sort of periodicity of between phases of blood and phases of fire. So what I want to do, okay, um, I'm going to take another 15 to 20, I mean that should be okay, shouldn't it? Is because I want to start to look at the Prometheus stories in the light of this type of material from hunter-gatherers. Um, I'm going to do that quite quickly, I'm just going to focus quite narrowly on the specific kind of fire aspect of the Prometheus stories, um, but I also want to bring uh, some of Aeschylus and Prometheus bound into it. Um, okay, so we've got two major stories. Some, some of you may be very familiar with the, the Greek Prometheus myth and others maybe not so much. Um, but I'm just going to focus down on the, on the key aspects and run a structure of blood and fire onto um, the sort of initial, the, the two major sources of Prometheus. Um, one is Hesiod's Theogony. So this is a very early work of, of archaic Greek, um, ancient Greek writing. And in Theogony, um, Prometheus is no great hero whatsoever. He's just a low down thief and a trickster, actually. Um, he doesn't get all that attention. And he plays a trick. He plays a trick on the gods, the great, the, the great new god. The, the new kid on the block, who's Zeus, who's just taken over power from his parents, Kronos and Rhea, um, and kicked them down to Tartarus. And Zeus has taken control. And Zeus is really a bit of a thug the, the, the whole time. Um, but it's very interesting to see what role Zeus is playing in respect of the meat. Because what Prometheus, he plays a trick on Zeus. And he is acting as the arbiter of what should be offered to the gods when they are offered sacrifice. So this is about the distribution of meat and meat being offered to, um, who is it to be offered to? And what Prometheus does is he presents Zeus with two possible piles and this is going to ordain how sacrifices are going to be made forever for the future to the Olympian gods. So he has one pile which is covered in a shiny fat, delicious fat, but inside it's just a pile of bones. And the other pile is covered in a rather nasty looking stomach, but inside delicious flesh and all the tasty bits put inside. So Prometheus has disguised this. And this is a classic trickster thing that you put what is outside inside and what's inside outside. This is really very trickster-like indeed. Um, so what Zeus looks at this and he falls for it and he goes for the lovely fat, but of course all he ends up getting is the bones. So this is going to decide forevermore that men will, that is what men will offer to the gods. They will just give them the bones with a little sprinkling of garnish of fat and the gods will get a little scent of that fat. But basically they all the flesh gets kept to men. Okay. I could say something about the Hadza, uh, Hadza men at Epime. I talked about the Epime ritual. Hadza men claim to themselves certain special cuts of meat called Epime, but they're incredibly secret about this. And if any woman found them eating Epime meat, she would be at threat of rape 
um, or, or being um, killed and very violently attacked. Um, but the point is that the men claim they're giving this meat to God. It's just like the trick of Prometheus, actually. But they're not. They're eating it themselves. <laughs> so this is all blood. It's raw meat. And Zeus reacts to this trick. He knows he's been fooled. And he decides, right, I'm going to take fire away from men. Or he's hiding fire from men. It's not perfectly clear if men had fire already or not. But he just, he takes the fire from men. Now notice in this role, Zeus is playing the part of like the female collective, the females who had control of the fire. Because Zeus has control of this fire and can hide it, he is supposed to be getting meat. But Prometheus has tricked him. Zeus hides the fire and then Prometheus does the only bit of his noble deed, if we can call it noble deed. He goes and he steals this fire from, in his fennel stalk, he gets the fire. He goes by the back doors of Olympus where the gods are now in their crowning glory. He goes and steals that fire and brings it for men. And this results in his terrifying, supposedly eternal punishment when Prometheus is bound bound on the rocks of Caucasus, really nailed, staked to the rocks, halfway between heaven and earth. And Prometheus is never going to, he's, he's facing an internal agony. He's never going to die. Um, his, his liver is exposed. So like a trickster, his insides are exposed. His liver is exposed and the eagle, which is the emblem of Zeus, comes every day to tear out the liver, but in the dark of the night, the liver regrows back to where it was. So it's like a pulse in the days consumed. Remember the syntax? Raw, bloody, hunger, being eaten is exactly what's happening to Prometheus. Um, consumed in the day, regrow in the night. Consumed in the day, regrow in the night. It's like this pulse, but incredibly fast. Okay. As a result of all of this, men get not just fire, but the last throw in the Hesiod is this, they get the first woman. There weren't any women yet. They get the first woman um, who is named in subsequent tradition, actually Pandora. And she brings this jar, Pandora's jar or box, um, so that it's like the sting in the tail that not only do men get the woman, this is like the origins of sex here, they get, she brings all the illness that escapes, but of course this last thing of hope is the last thing. But so we have the first fire, first sex, first death and illness, all, all stacked up there. Um, quite clear, distinct division of a periodicity of phases of blood, fire, blood, fire. I think it's, it's really very clear to see it. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell the other aspect of Prometheus, which can help, I think, give us more to go on. Um, we're seeing how Prometheus can be seen, can be analysed in terms of a kind of, well, we are talking about meat, control over meat, control over fire, access to sex, all the same terms that belonged to the hunter-gatherer stories of the origins of fire. So this really can be thought of in terms of a kind of hunter-gatherer basic strata. Um, but I now turn to Aeschylus and uh, the great tragedian Aeschylus, the early Greek tragedian. There is some dispute over who actually did write um, Prometheus Bound. Um, but in Prometheus Bound, we have a completely different depiction of Prometheus, where he becomes this noble and upright hero who has done this great deed, benefit to, to humankind, um, and for which he is punished by this upstart Olympian god Zeus, who is portrayed as the, really the ultimate tyrant um, thug um, with all his henchmen. And indeed the opening of the play of, of, of Prometheus Bound is a is grim description of all that's done to the body of Prometheus in binding him and, and staking him on the Caucasus. And the henchmen of Zeus, you know, Aeschylus doesn't even, Discard, give them names. They're just called strength and violence. 
It's that simple. Um, in, in addition, there is Hephaestus, the god of fire, who's a kind of aspect of, he's got a sort of, Prometheus is a titan, Hephaestus is an Olympian, um, a son of Zeus. So they're, but they're sort of rather similar to each other in certain ways, but one is on the right side and one's on the wrong side. In addition to these male characters who are the henchmen of Zeus, all the males in the play are basically um, Zeus's henchmen. Apart from Okeanus, um, the god of the sea, and the chorus, who are the daughters of Okeanus, they're the Okeanides. Now, this is interesting because in the classic tradition, Prometheus's mother, Clymene, is, um, in Hesiod's tradition, Clymene is one of the Okeanides. And the chorus is constantly sympathizing. It is basically a great collection of the women, of the, of the female spirits of the sea, of the, of the water spirits. Um, so they are wet, um, making their chorus, their noise, um, sympathizing with the, the punished Prometheus. Um, and in addition, there is the, the centerpiece of this uh, present this drama of Prometheus Bound is an extraordinary encounter between Io, so I will need to say something about the story of Io, Io who has been turned into a heifer um, actually by Hera, Zeus's consort, um, and is a cow, a beautiful cow with, with horns. We're seeing Io here. Now many people are just quite unclear. Why, why, why has Aeschylus got Io coming along, galloping past Prometheus on the mountain, the Caucasus Mountains. What's going on with that? Um, but just to say in the first place, um, Io's relationship to Prometheus, Io is the daughter of a river god, Inachus, who is one of the brothers of the sisters, the Okeanides. So there are actually, um, there are actually matrilineal clan relationships between Prometheus and the Oceanides and Prometheus and Io, because um, Io's parentage is probably incestuous. So, so they are actually a sort of rep, and, and Aeschylus does this often in the Oresteia, for instance, the representation of the mother right clan. So the chorus of the Oceanides and Io themselves, they have sort of maternal relationships. We can, we can call it that, maternal clan relationships. Okay, so we've got this, this extraordinary juxtaposition, and I'm not, of, of Prometheus is stuck, absolutely nailed, staked on the rock, halfway um, at the top of the Caucasus, being preyed upon by the eagle. I, in this depiction of, this is Salvatore Rosa's um, depiction, there were many depictions of Prometheus in the Renaissance and we can quite clearly, this is a, I'm just going to say very clearly, this is evidently a menstruating male. Um, you, you've got the blood pouring down over his genitals. It is a depiction of menstruating male. I don't think Salvatore Rosa knew that, but yeah, that, that's what it is. Um, Prometheus is doing some form of male menstruation that would tally with the sort of Aboriginal Australian practice, ritual practice. He is some kind of... Um, a type of male initiate who is standing in, he's appropriating these powers. Um, and Io, on the other side, may represent, the, may represent a, a reproductive potency as this cow, as, as this heifer. Um, and we're going to investigate just exactly what, what she might um, represent. But just to say, um, you know, Prometheus's menstruation is happening far too fast, daily, so quickly, the pulse. So we are getting in this story uh, a preoccupation with what I just mentioned at the beginning, periodicity. That this, Prometheus is stuck, too, period, too swift periodicity. Io, let's just so basically tell the story of Io. Io is the daughter of Inachus, the river of Argos, um, and she's a priestess. Her name means moon. Her name is the same as Matu the, in the pygmy story. Her name means moon. 
and she is the uh, priestess of Hera in the temple. Um, and she has been, and Zeus has seen her. Zeus is like the ultimate alpha male, has seen her, lusted after her, and Io has tried to say no on sex strike. Um, but her father doesn't help because he throws her out of the house. There's an, or an oracle that says if she doesn't submit to Zeus, mankind will be destroyed, and so her father doesn't help. So Zeus tries to hide Io from his jealous wife, sister Zihira, by turning her into this heifer, the, <coughs> the young cow with the beautiful lunar horns. Um, Hera then turns up and says, oh, what a beautiful heifer. Please give me the heifer. Um, and Zeus can't say no, but, but uh, he, he, want, he schemes to get the heifer back. Herme, um, Hera sets to guard on Io Argos, who has the hundred eyes. You can see the eyes on, on his scales, almost like dragon scales, Argos's hundred eyes. But Zeus sends his messenger Hermes, his, his, um, another henchman Hermes, to lull Argos, who's ever watchful with his hundred eyes, to sleep with panpipes. It's rather like the Orphic story. Um, and then Hermes decapitates Argos and all his eyes. So he, he, he can't guard anymore. Hera then intervenes by sending a gadfly to keep stinging Io, keep biting Io. And Io just goes, runs wild, runs mad, and just keeps, and just runs and runs and keeps running. And this all starts in Argos. Io goes running around past the Ionian Sea. She goes up through the Danube Delta. She's going right up around the Back Sea, across a Bosporus, ox crossing. Um, and she goes right around to or Caucasus, and that isn't the beginning of half her journey. She's going to go right around India, across Arabia, down into Ethiopia, up eventually the Nile Valley. So what we've got a picture of the, ma the male menstruant totally nailed down, far too quickly pulse uh, be, uh, pulsing much too quickly in the periodicity. Io. Uh, Io, who should be the, the, men, the moon priestess, she should be the menstrual secluded um, girl. She should be in the one place being sent constant movement, constant movement through space. Um, a mapping, you could see that Io is kind of mapping a, territory, a terrain of Greek you know, cosmos and, and the whole territory that the Greeks know, know the known world for the Greeks. So if we think in terms of the, the Wawalak sisters, the Jangawal sisters who were mapping out all the lands and all the things, this is kind of what's going on with Io as well. Too much noise, Hilary. Okay, I'm gonna read a little, uh, a few passages to give some flavor of what's going on. Um, Shall I read some of the tragedy? I'm going to do it because uh, the, it gives the real sense of, of, of what's happening. Um, sorry, I just lost my page now. I'm sorry, we could do the whole, um, another half an hour on this argument, but I would try and... So she's racing in, she's racing in, she, she, she just can't stop moving because of this gadfly. What land is this? What race lives here? Who is this? And I see held in fetters of rock. She's found, she's come across Prometheus at the mercy of wind and storm. For what sin do you suffer such a death? Tell me, where's my miserable wandering brought me? Um, the gadfly stings me again. Oh, oh, I see the ghost of Argos, the her earthborn herdsman with a thousand eyes. Gods, keep him away. He was killed, but no earth can hide him. He follows me with his crafty gaze kind of the ultimate male gaze here. <laughs> okay, so where, where, where will my endless, endless journeys bring me? Son of Kronos, that is Zeus. What have I done? What sin did you find in me? She's hur hurling her words against Zeus. I mean, the, the whole of this play, people doubt that Aeschylus wrote it because the whole of this play is like a, a defiant cry against Zeus, the Olympian gods. So it's very subversive. Um, 
she wants to be burned by fire and swallowed by the earth and, and food for sea ser serpents. Lord God, will you grudge me this prayer? I have wandered so far. I've been punished enough with wandering. I cannot tell how to escape from pain. Do you hear my voice? It is Io, the girl with horns, is how she describes herself. I actually showed you a girl with horns already earlier. The one in the Elan bull dance, the one in the hut with all the women dancing around and their horns. A girl with horns in the story of the Bushman is a girl on menstrual seclusion. She's a menstrual initiate. Now those girls with horns in the Bushman uh, rituals, if, if, they, if a hunter comes close to them, she can call down the lightning and it strikes them, or she can just look at them and they will turn to rock or s trees. Yeah, we've heard that. We're going to hear more about that ability because that, of course, is the ability of the Gorgons. Mm -hmm. um, so Io, the girl with horns, she's really a menstrual initiate, a real one. Prometheus, the male menstruant, is n not a real menstrual initiate. He's a, he's a male initiate who is serving as a channel for the appropriation of this potency of Io. But he does certain things. In this um, dialogue between Io and Prometheus, um, he is going to tell her two things. He is going to give her secret knowledge or secret instructions. Um, what Io wants to know from this poor guy lying here, she first of all asks, well, what on earth happened to you and they both realize that Zeus is the one to blame Zeus this mighty dominant alpha male is the one to blame for all their sufferings Io's sufferings Prometheus's sufferings so they really bond over the fact that Zeus has caused the trouble for them both um, but she wa she wants to know well how far have I got to go where, where am I going where, what is going to happen um, and Z Prometheus first doesn't want to tell her. If I tell you, I'll break your heart. You just, you just don't want to know. Um, but the chorus intervenes and first of all says, well, Io, you tell us, the chorus is all the time sort of facilitating this, this conversation and says, first of all, tell Io, you tell, tell your story. So she tells this terrible story of how Zeus came to seduce her and how she got thrown out by her father and then she got turned into the heifer and then the gadfly and Argo oh and it, the whole horrible thing. Um, and the chorus does its chorus thing of sympathizing. Oh, what a terrible, pitiful fate. Never did I dream so strange a story. And Prometheus then, the only misogynist remark he really makes is, you shed your tears too early like a frightened woman. You know, I, keep them until you hear what's to follow now, you know, because it's going to get worse. You think that's bad, it's going to get worse. Um, so, uh, so he's let um, Io tell the st his story that you wish to hear Io's ordeal. Now um, I've got the words for the daughter of Inachus, the, the river, learn the goal of all your journeys. So he is going to reveal to her the purpose, this kind of big plan that's going to happen uh, for, uh, for, for all her terrible. And he starts to map, he starts to name the places that she's going to go and include this includes well I could I, I could start going into it but especially she goes past the the Amazons she meets the Amazons the haters of men um, who will most gladly guide you on her, your way but he warns her about others who may be savages who might attack her and and don't go this way go that way um, and he mentions the Bosporus I actually think he goes the wrong way around the Black Sea when he's talking in this, this bit. Um, but of course, the reason why is that when he's talking about the Bosporus, does everybody remember Europe, who is also turned into a cow? And the Bosporus is the crossing from Europe to Asia when she was turned into a cow because she was being raped by Zeus. and, got, and uh, So this story keeps repeating itself. Europe is the descendant, is going to be the descendant of Io. So now what Prometheus is doing is not just mapping Io's movement in space 
over this whole terrain of the Greek known world. But he is mapping the generations down through time and giving her the periodicity, giving her the periodicity that's going to ultimately arrive 13 generations down to the man who is going to be able to liberate Prometheus, and that is Heracles, 13 generations down of, from Io. Io is going to produce at uh, nine generations Perseus, the killer of the Gorgons, the murderer, so called hero, the murderer of the Gorgons, Medusa. Um, and Perseus, uh, and, and there are various um, references to the Graii and the Gorgons in. Uh, Perse in, in Prometheus's map of all the movements of, of Io. Um, but the, the most interesting descendants of Io, in fact, are the Danaids. And I'm just going to read again a short, 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 I'm so sorry, a short, short, a short, short bit of this, because this is like the Danaids, uh, people may not be familiar, but they are the ultimate Greek sex stripe coalition who refused sex to men and, and murdered their husbands on their wedding night. Let me just do this and then I'll try and wrap it up. Uh, so, so Prometheus tells the story of how she's finally going to come to the mouth of the Nile and then at last Zeus, thank you Zeus, will restore your mind and come upon you, not with terror, but with a gentle touch. And so she will have a child, actually a dark skinned son of Zeus called Epaphos, who will hold the harvest wealth of all those lands watered by the broad flowing Nile. Five generations from him, a family of 50 sisters shall return against their will to Argos, desperate to escape from kindred marriage. That means incestuous marriage with their cousins. These are cousins of the brother of their father the sons of the brother of their father, 50 sons, 50 uh, daughters, who are f the daughters forced into marriage. Their father prepares the daughters by giving them pins in their hair that on the wedding night, they will stab, each one of them will stab their husband. So instead of wedding, marriage, sex, they have blood and no sex, okay. Um, uh, but one woman alone, Hypermnestra, does not, spares her husband. Why? Because her husband doesn't rape her or try to rape her. So he actually, she actually lets him off. It's nice. She helps him escape by lighting a beacon, giving him a signal. So fire, a light, overcomes the blood. Um, and through there, through those two, all the other Danaids, their husbands are dead. But through that pair, Hypernestra and her husband, Lynchus, descend Perseus and ultimately Heracles. Perseus, the slayer of the Gorgons, ultimately Heracles. Okay, so let's just try and, if we remember the wives of sun and moon, what Prometheus' speech to Io about this map of her movements through space and her ultimate destination and then the generations of time that are going to give rise to these dragon slaying descendants who ultimately Heracles will liberate Prometheus. Um, he, he, he is like the father who, in the Wives of Sun and Moon, who is um, teaching the wife um, who suddenly gives birth without warning how to give birth, how to organize her reproductive cycles. It's as if he is ordaining the reproductive powers of Io but he's also appropriating these powers into, uh, you know, to become this male menstruant initiate. And the, pa the Prometheus has denied to the Olympian gods the, all the riches of the meat. Um, and he is claiming for initiated males with secret knowledge. Always it's stressed that Prometheus has two aspects of secret knowledge, which he passes to Io in exchange for her reproductive potency, if you like. The, the reproductive knowledge of where is Io going, the secret knowledge of where is Io going, and the secret knowledge of what shall be her descendants. And these are aspects of prophecy that he, he grudgingly gives to Io with the, with the chorus 
um, facilitating hit the, that dialogue. Okay, so that is my take. I'm sorry it's taken a little bit long and I've had to curtail a bit because um, I would like to read more of that, um, <laughs> particularly, particularly, particularly because um, they have this, they, this whole thing is about the overthrow. You, Prometheus thinks he's going to be able to overthrow Zeus. Um, the very last bit of, uh, East, of Prometheus Bound has Zeus's ultimate henchman, Hermes, the one who killed Argos and, and tried to get Io, um, coming to Prometheus to try to do a deal because Prometheus has this secret knowledge of who is going to overthrow Zeus. And um, Hermes says, you know, we can let you off if you tell us. But, but Prometheus said, I'm not going to talk to you, you scum. And it, it, whilst he's nailed there, he, he's totally disrespectful and scornful of, of Hermes and Zeus, in, ultimately so. Okay.